Hey, thank you for joining us. We're, we're praying that our resources will strengthen your faith in God and grow your love for others. We'd love to hear from you and help you get connected in community. Check out the link in the description below and connect with us. If you're joining us live, meet us in the live chat. Say hello. Feel free to leave a comment below. Let us know how God is speaking to you today through the worship or through the message. In the description, uh, you'll find our various social media platforms where you can connect with us further as well. So please don't hesitate to reach out with any questions uh, and especially if you'd love to get connected. As we begin, grab a Bible, a pen, a notebook, and ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you uh, through His Word today. We all pray and ask God for things, and there's nothing wrong with asking Him for things. He welcomes it. He loves to give good gifts to his children, as the Bible teaches us. And often the, the gifts that we request are things like wisdom for a situation or money or health or even success in one way or another. And, and these things aren't bad things, but uh, as Paul prays for the churches in, in the book of Corinthians, as he prays for the Corinthian church, he has uh, some different types of gifts in mind for them. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, where we're going to be today, looking at Paul's prayer for this church, from verses 4 through 9, Paul was thinking about spiritual gifts. And he explains that God gives different spiritual gifts to different members of the church so that we can encourage or strengthen each other. And many of the gifts are actually things that God gives you to give to someone else. We're strengthened by the gifts of the Spirit and others are strengthened when we, when we use those gifts to serve them. So, for an example, when God gives me a word of encouragement for someone, then I'm supposed to give that encouragement to them. And in the process, we both end up encouraged. So most of the spiritual gifts work this way. And that's why Paul opens the book, this letter to this church, just thanking God for the gifts that he sees in this church. So let's, uh, let's read it together. I'd like to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And again, we're just going to read verses 4 to 9. I won't read the whole section. I'll just read and make comments as we work our way through it. So starting in verse 4, he says um, here, I always thank my God for you and the gracious gifts that he has given you now that you belong to Christ Jesus. Now, as Paul often does, he begins this prayer by just thanking God for the believers at Corinth. And this is encouraging to read at the beginning of, of this particular letter because the rest of the book, Paul goes on to really confront and even correct many of the problems that were in the church here at Corinth. But still, he, he begins his prayer just by thanking God for the believers. Uh, there in verse 4, Paul actually says, I, I always thank my God for you and for the gracious gifts that he's given you. Uh, now that you belong to Christ Jesus. So Paul chooses really to focus first on God and, and what God has done rather than just immediately focusing on all the problems in the church and all the difficulties that this church was facing. And really it kind of reveals right off the bat just a principle that we should take to heart. In, in all the things that are going wrong, we have to stop ourselves and remember what's right and, and what's good in our lives. And when we focus first on, on the gifts and the blessings that we have in, in Christ, uh, we can always rejoice, or, or like the Bible says, rejoice in the Lord always, because the Bible encourages to, us to do that, and we can rejoice even when we're going through hard or complicated situations. So, so here, in this prayer, Paul really starts just by thanking God for the great and gracious gifts that God had given to the church. But at the end of his first line in this prayer, he says uh, something else. He says, now, I want to thank God for the gracious gifts he's given you now that you belong to Christ Jesus. Uh, the greatest gift that we've been given really is the gift of belonging. Now that we belong to Christ Jesus. Uh, we, we can never really replace uh, the, the, the other incredible gifts that God gives us. We can never let them outweigh or overshadow the greatest gift that God has given us, which is because of Jesus Christ, we belong to God as his dearly loved children, as a part of God's family. And this, by far, is the greatest gift. To, to know God as Father, to, to belong as a part of his family, to be an heir to, to his inheritance, 
He goes on to say, because we belong to Christ Jesus, uh, we've been given these gifts. You'll have to look at, at verse 5 with me because he says, Through him, through Jesus, God has enriched your church in every way with all of your eloquent words and all of your knowledge. When the members of the church exercise their spiritual gifts, as Paul's describing here, the church is enriched. And Paul goes on as he discusses later in this book, later in chapter 12, that, that a church that's exercising its spiritual gifts really is like a healthy body that's correctly using all of its different body parts. Each part of a healthy body benefits all the other parts of the same body. And this is true about Christ's body, which is also the church. And then Paul lists, if you remember here, he, he lists two specific ways that God had gifted or enriched that specific church. For the Corinthians, he says, uh, with your eloquent words and your knowledge. Well, later in the book, uh, Paul lists so many other gifts that the Spirit gives to the church as well. In other words, the, the members of each church are gifted in particular ways to that church that serve to benefit that church and serve to benefit the, the mission of that church in its surrounding city or region. And, and there are really a variety of ways in which the Spirit gifts uh, different individuals to serve each local church. Some of these gifts, as Paul will go on to explain, are, are wisdom, knowledge, faith, healing, miracles, prophecy, discernment, and so on. While not every believer has every gift, all believers have at least one gift. And of course, for us to have the full experience of God's presence and power, this means that we actually need all of His gifts working together, which means we need each other working together to really experience all that God has for us. You don't have all the gifts that you need, nor can you accomplish all that, that God wants for your life in your own power with just your own gifts. We need each other. And there's an, a little bit of encouragement here and maybe a little bit of relief for me as I see it anyway. It, it's, just, it's relieving to realize that it's, it's not just that I can't do this on my own, but that this life isn't really designed for me to be able to do it on my own. For me, that means I'm not a lesser human or a lesser leader if I need others in my life. So, so when I hear this news and believe it, then I can start living like it's true, which means that now I might be free to ask for help or advice without any fear of how it might make me look. I'm free from the pressure to do everything myself or figure out things on my own without being afraid to admit that maybe I wasn't good enough on my own. I'm free to obey God with what he puts right in front of me, and I can be excited for others, you know, when God is calling them to do something different different things, other things than what God might be calling me to do. And as a church, we, we can celebrate what other churches are doing too. We're not able to do everything that all the churches should be doing. Several churches might focus on one area of, of justice, while several other churches focus on other areas of justice in the region. And one church might be gifted with musicians, and, and another church might have multiple teachers. One church is experiencing a breakthrough in an area of just spiritual warfare, while another church might be experiencing God's presence in, in profound ways as they go through intense suffering together. The, the, the churches are working together in every region and all around the world to accomplish God's purposes in the world. So we're free as a church from having to run every new program. Or we're free really to be able to just celebrate the wins and the successes of God's family, no matter uh, which person or which church gets the recognition. And, and that's true, really, for each one of us within one church. Uh, one person might have the gift of discernment. Another person might have uh, a gift of teaching. Another person might have the gift of mercy. Another person might have the gift of administration or leadership. See, working together, a group like that, could obviously accomplish more than really any of them could do on their own especially when you see them as spiritual gifts, meaning not only, uh, not only does the Spirit give you those gifts, but, but the Spirit directs how those gifts are used. Even if I had the gift of mercy, I still need the Spirit to direct that gift toward people who need mercy. Uh, if I had the, the gift of giving and I had the resources to give, I still need the Spirit to show me who needs what I have to give uh, with the gift of teaching. I still regularly have to ask the Holy Spirit what he wants me to teach. 
These spiritual gifts aren't just you know, to do whatever we want with them, but they're to be directed by the Spirit, like the way a conductor might you know, direct an orchestra. The Spirit works in each of us to produce something greater together than, than any of the parts would be on their own. And there's a, there's a little bit of freedom here in this too, for me and you, just to be fully devoted to God's purpose for our lives without feeling like, like we have to compete or, or compare ourselves to, to anyone else. And the same is true uh, for our church with other churches. Uh, the same is true for your business with, with any other business or, or uh, you know, comparing your parenting or your family's uh, patterns with uh, someone else's parenting or family style or, or comparing your career path to someone else's or comparing your stage of life uh, to someone else's and, and so on and so forth. Uh, you see, belonging to Jesus and, and having gifts from God to us uh, really give us a sense of identity and purpose in life. When we feel empty or when we lack a, a sense of purpose for our lives, we start trying to fill that gap with things that we think matter. And then worst of all, since we're deriving our sense of worth from whatever that thing is, we start using that thing to evaluate other people with it. It makes us feel better or worse. But you know, if you, if you believe differently, for instance, if you believe differently than, than me on this random and, and completely secondary theological issue, then I start to wonder uh, because I've made that a, a value of mine. Or maybe education is a value. And so then you look at someone else and say, you don't have a, an education. Hmm. Or, or maybe homeschooling. You don't homeschool your kids. You send them to public school. Or, or maybe uh, it might be something like you're, you're not as serious as, as, and, and, and as dedicated to children's sports programs as we are. Hmm. Or maybe uh, you're not as passionate about the same social justice issue that, that I'm passionate about. You're, you're more passionate about a, a different one. Hmm. Or maybe you work in an office, a nine to five. You don't own your own business. Hmm. I know I'm kind of picking fun at us a little bit, but you see, when we're not clear that God has given everyone different gifts, and especially that what you have is also a gift, then you just start judging or evaluating others, and you start to think more highly of yourself than you ought. None of us are self-made. Uh, that's laughable. Really, none of us have something that God didn't give us. And this is a good kind of humbling that we need. It's, it's freedom, freedom from this burdensome way of living and, and a burdensome way of relating to others really can be found in the good news of Jesus that we need to remember from earlier. Remember, the greatest gift you have really isn't what you can do or how much you make or how much you have or how well you perform or what you've achieved or any of those things. The greatest gift that you and I have is that we belong to Christ Jesus that we belong to God as one of God's children, as a part of his family, where he has other children, that he's also gifted, but in different ways, for a different purpose in their life than yours. And that's good. And so now that we're clear on this, I think we can really just focus on, on our own lives in this way instead of others, and then just ask, am I doing what God's calling me to do? Now that you know, things have been shut down for a few months in our society and we've been sort of forced out of much of what used to fill our time, it's a really good time to just ask, have I been doing, before all this happened, have I been doing less than or maybe more than what God is asking me to do? I mean, before we go right back into all the thousands of things that used to, to fill our, our time and fill our schedules, take a minute. And then just ask whether you were fully devoted to God in terms of your schedule and all of your activities. I mean, were they things that you had talked with him about? Were you doing less than what God was asking you to do? Or were you doing more than God was asking you to do? Over the, the next few weeks, really the next maybe week or two before things really start ramping up again, spend some time with God. Spend some time with friends. Spend some time just talking about ways that you might have been neglecting the gifts that God has given you. Or maybe you've been using them for your own purposes and agenda. Maybe you've been doing less than God wants for you. Or maybe you've been doing more than God has asked you to do. And either way, really, it's, it's a discussion that's worth having. So why don't we ever stop to ask God or our spouse or our parents or maybe some godly trusted friends before we decide to just add things to our lives? 
Well, usually it's because we don't want to hear them say, no, you shouldn't do that, not yet, it's not a good idea. See, we want what we want, we want it when we want it. And our pride leads to our downfall. So, so first, um, I want us to focus on holiness or complete devotion to God in every area of our lives. And from there, we can slowly find our way back to healthy energy levels and, and a healthy uh, sense of margin in our lives. And once we've got that, because we're doing no more, no less than what God is asking, then we can start to find increasing freedom in our lives from anyone else's expectations. The, the more confident I am that I'm walking in the Spirit, doing what He asked me to do with the gifts that He's given me, and, and talking with people that I trust about the decisions that I'm making, then the less concerned that you and I have to be with what anyone else thinks. And again, there's freedom here when we're living within the gifts and the leadership of God's Spirit in our lives. So we need to pick it back up in verses 7 and 8. He, he says in, in verse 7, Now, uh, you have every spiritual gift you need as you eagerly wait for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be free from all blame on the day when our Lord Jesus Christ returns. Because of the, the Spirit of God, because the Spirit of God is the one who really distributes these, these gifts to his people, Paul could assure the, the, the church at Corinth there that each of them had all that they needed and that as a church, as a whole, they had all that they needed in order to serve Jesus and accomplish his mission as they waited for Jesus to return. God really doesn't leave us to do this all on our own. Verse 8 says that God himself will strengthen us and make us blameless. It's a work that he does in us. It's not completely up to you. God gives us the strength and he makes us blameless as we, over time, are devoting more and more of our lives to him. God wouldn't simply just give us spiritual gifts you know, to all of his people and then just leave them on their own to figure it out. I mean, according to Paul, the, the basis for this promise that, that God himself would keep us strong and make us blameless really is the character of God himself. Look at verse 9, and that's how he sort of ends this prayer in, in verse 9. He says, God will do this. God will do this. For he is faithful to do what he says. And he has invited you into partnership with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul tells the, the Corinthians something we need to hear, that, that God would do all of these things for them because he is faithful. The, the gifting, the empowerment of the Spirit really wasn't contingent on the willpower or self-righteousness or the goodness of the Corinthians. If that had been the case, uh, they, they would have been in a lot of trouble. And it's this, the, the same is true for us. Uh, this, also, this was a church that was in a bit of trouble uh, because they really lacked the discipline and discernment that they needed. Uh, this church, um, and a few other things, but this church was, um, as we learn, mostly a non-Jewish church. So they were really navigating what it looked like to live godly lives in a non-Jewish context. Uh, and there was you know, so much room for disagreement. This left a lot of room, too, for false teachers to come in and confuse them. We're plagued with so many voices today as well. I mean, this is what the church should do. Uh, this is uh, what Christians should be doing. This is who Christians should be voting for. This is what Christians should be against. And this is what they should be for. And it just becomes tough at times to discern what voices to listen to. At least I hope it's tough for you sometimes. If you're swallowing everything that just one particular media outlet is feeding you, without really questioning it or weighing it against God's word, then, then I'm nervous for you. Anyway, this church had other issues too. It was made up of, of a variety of, of just social classes. There were manual laborers. There, there were um, estate owners here in the church. And really what happened in the church is it created a lot of deep division in the body there. And we have to guard against this in, in our churches today as well. We can't allow social status or economic status or things like race to divide us into groups and then pit us against one another. This is not the way of the church. It is the way of the world, obviously, but, but the church is meant to be a new humanity, a new way of living through which really the Spirit is working to reverse the, the, the brokenness of our sinful ways. 
and, and that's, that's why Paul ends this section with just a reminder of God's grace, that he will do it. God will do this, he says, for he is faithful to, to do what he says. And then look at the next phrase, faithful to do what he says, and he has invited you into partnership with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul wanted the the Christians in Corinth to think back to the time when they had trusted Christ. They they accepted the simple invitation of the gospel or the good news about Jesus to simply repent or turn from their sin and place their faith in Jesus Christ alone. This invitation, if, if they were to remember and if you could just remember, really wasn't based on your goodness or their goodness. It wasn't based on their willpower or our natural abilities. It was simply an invitation based on God's grace. And this is the same God, Paul wants us to know, who is now promising to make us partners with Jesus on the same basis, though. Not our goodness, not our willpower, not our natural abilities, but as a grace gift, a, a gracious gift based on God's grace to each of us. And I love that Paul describes this as uh, God's invitation to us, an invitation to partnership with his son Jesus. This is amazing when you think about it. Those who have trusted Jesus are now partners with him in his mission. And we fellowship or share with him in all of his riches. God doesn't simply tolerate sinners who have come to him by faith. He places them into partnership with his son. And then he gifts them for service. And then he empowers them to use those gifts to show love to others. The spirit of God really works within each of us and within our church family as a whole so that we can accomplish the mission that God has for us. So that together we can experience the partnership that we have with Jesus in his good news. So so I'm sharing this with you. You can do really what you want with this news that I'm sharing, but I'm encouraging you to receive the news. Believe that it's true. I want you to see yourself as someone who's been invited by God into partnership with his son. I want you to consider that God is inviting you to belong to Jesus. And we want you, uh, we want to be a church really where you can belong with us too. If you're a follower of Jesus, you belong to God. And he's given you gifts, all the gifts, really, that the church needs. And so there's just so much hope for us in this, isn't there? And if you haven't considered yourself to be a follower of Jesus, then I encourage you, would you turn to God and receive this invitation to be a part of God's family today? You might be surprised at how good and how freeing it is to belong to Jesus. Thank you for joining us today. We hope that you're encouraged. and We'd love to hear how the worship or the message is impacting you today. And we'd love to encourage you to take a next step of faith in your relationship with God. If you've never embraced Jesus as your savior or never committed your life to following him, we want to encourage you to do that right where you are. Through Jesus, we've received the greatest gift that we could ever be given. It's the gift of belonging to God's family. And this is free to us without having to earn it. So we encourage you to turn to God in prayer and just say thank you. If you'd like to talk with us a little more about taking that step of faith to follow Jesus, then we'd love to hear from you. Just click on the link in the description below and connect with us, and then one of our leaders will respond to you right away. To anyone who's watching, to everyone, please don't hesitate to reach out to us with any questions that you have or any needs that you might have. We're praying that you will find hope in Jesus to anchor your soul. Thanks for joining us today and we hope to see you again soon.